Okay, here we go, taking a look at chapter 11.3. This is lesson number one, and all we're looking at in this particular lesson here is just the various different ways that we can communicate and show the enthalpy changes, or energy changes, that take place in our various chemical reactions. And so what we're going to see is that there are four very common and utilized ways in which we can express these enthalpy changes. So we've got four different ways that we're going to look at it. And uh, each one communicates the exact same thing. It's just a different style or a slightly different, um, call it flavor or take on the idea. So uh, as we look at these, please realize that we're talking about our chemical reactions. And our chemical reactions are always exothermic or endothermic. You will heard me say that in class, there's really no such thing as an isothermic reaction or a chemical reaction that doesn't involve changes in energy. Um, just from a, a simplistic point of view, if there was no change in energy, then there'd be no reason for the reaction. Um, if we didn't get an exothermic reaction, it would likely not be a spontaneous reaction that would happen easily. And if there was no uh, energy input, um, it doesn't really make sense as to how we might be able to force a reaction or produce product. So all of these just really take into consideration the fact that every single chemical reaction that we study is either exothermic and releases energy along with the products, or is endothermic and requires an energy input to produce products. So the first one is one that we've seen already, and it is a molar enthalpy change. This is our best one. It fits with the Lorentz method. It certainly fits with everything we did at the end of calor uh, calorimetry and dealing with molar enthalpies in how we looked at, we want to standardize our energy for the mole quantities that we see in a chemical reaction. So what this does is it tells us that we have a certain amount of energy released or absorbed for a specific substance, that's pretty standard, for a specific reaction per mole of that substance. So this gives us the most specificity of any of the methods. You can kind of see that over here. We have delta H, which is your, which is your enthalpy change. Pardon me. We can see the subscript M, which is telling us that it's a molar quantity. And then since it's a molar quantity, we need to know what substance it is. So that gets written underneath. We do like to talk about the types of reactions. So combustion is different than formation which is different than decomposition, which is different than single replacement, and so on and so forth. So enthalpy changes for one substance might be different depending upon the type of reaction. And then this just means standard conditions and standard states, such as STP or SATP. So if we take a look at some examples, take a look at methane. If I want to form a mole of methane, then you can see that it gives off, due to the negative, 74.6 kilojoules for every mole of methane formed. So it means the formation of methane is an exothermic pro uh, process, and it gives off a good chunk of energy, 74.6 kilojoules, for every one mole of methane that you form. But note the difference down here, compared to up here. What if I burn some methane? So now I'm going to burn one mole of methane, Okay, well that is going to be exothermic, as most combustion reactions should be, and gives off way more, like over 10 times more, 802.5 kilojoules for every mole that is burned. So note, we're dealing with methane, but we're dealing with two different chemical reactions involving methane, and so the molar enthalpy changes along with that substance in different reactions can produce different numbers. Okay, hope that made sense. We'll slide here, we'll take a look at method number two. As we look at method number two, this is just the generic enthalpy changes. This is what we first started to look at as we started to see these. Um, what sort of energy we get for some random quantity of a substance undergoing a chemical reaction. This is more realistic in the fact that we generally don't have exact one mole quantities when we're dealing with labs. All right, so we just measure an enthalpy change, be it with a calorimeter or some other device, and we have a certain enthalpy change for whatever amount of reactant uh, or product we were relating it to. So this again goes along with the balanced equation, but is dealing with a specific measured amount. This could be an amount in grams, for example. This could be an amount of solution with a known concentration. 
This could be for a certain volume of a gas at a certain temperature and pressure. So this could be just about anything, and it kind of fits more along the lines with how we work with the numbers uh, in chemistry. Okay, for formula guys, there you go, there it is. But what we're taking a look at here is that you have an enthalpy change just measured in kilojoules. This is dependent upon the whole equation that is balanced and for the measured amount that we have. Now, this will seem kind of similar in which we have a one mole quantity of sulfur dioxide reacting with half mole quantity of oxygen to produce one mole quantity of sulfur, uh, sulfur trioxide. So, if we take a look at the combustion of sulfur dioxide, we can see that the amount of energy given off here is 98.9 kilojoules. We doubled the quantity here, doubled this, doubled this, so it makes sense that we would double the energy released for this. And so if we wanted to uh, turn this back to method one and look at a molar quantity, especially looking at number two here, we have 197.8 kilojoules given off for a two mole quantity of sulfur dioxide. That works out to 98.9 kilojoules per mole. So why do we have the same number but different units? Well, this is just the energy given for the quantities in this reaction. It happens to be 98.9 because of the one mole quantity. I just did the math here with the two mole quantity to prove that point. So enthalpy change, delta H, and molar enthalpy change, delta HM, uh, can be the same if you're dealing with a one mole quantity. Just be mindful of how you are quantifying this information. Okay, this is the energy released because it's a delta H for all of the quantities in the reaction. This is the delta HM because reaction two had a two mole quantity, and so we were able to simplify the numbers. Okay, moving on here, let's take a look at method three. All we're going to do is write these terms as part of the balanced uh, chemical equation. When we take a look at this, energy is either a reactant or a product in these. And of course, is measured generally in kilojoules. And all we'll do is realize that endothermic reactions require energy. So the energy term should be written in as a reactant. Exothermic reactions produce energy. So it makes sense to write the energy term in as a product. And I'll show you what that means on the next page. So very similar to method two, where we had the delta H as a statement, just as an aside for the equation, all we're going to do is kind of sneak this one in here. So for your reaction being endothermic, then any energy term must be listed as a reactant. This energy must be available. We must input this energy to be able to make the reaction take place. So as we take a look at an example here, water is being decomposed into hydrogen and oxygen. In order to do that, I need to put in 285.5 kilojoules of energy in order to be able to do this. For what quantity of water? It's a one mole quantity. So again, molar enthalpies can be derived from this style of presentation, just like they could in method two. Okay, so it took energy. So we have an input of 285.5 here for this particular reaction based upon the quantities that we see. If I want to burn magnesium in the presence of oxygen to produce magnesium oxide, Combustion reactions are, are generally endo, or pardon me, exothermic, and so this one gives off 601.6 kilojoules. So the delta H of this particular reaction, its combustion reaction, would be uh, negative 601.6 kilojoules, and we could also determine the delta CHM from this one, all right, and realize that it is negative 601.6 kilojoules given off for every one mole of magnesium burned, because we don't have any other quantity given. So there's your kilojoules per mole. So again, all of these guys are interrelated. They are all variations on this same theme. It's just how we're presenting it. The one thing you do have to be uh, careful with here is that when we're writing it in the equation, remember these plus symbols just mean and. So this equation reads magnesium and half a mole of oxygen produce magnesium oxide and 601.6 kilojoules. In the delta H formats, it is a negative delta H to show exothermy. So please don't put a subtraction symbol into your statements. Uh, one more to take a look at here, and that's just method number four. And I know how much you guys love your graphs. What we're gonna do is take a look at these reactions over time. And so this is kind of a blend of what I would call methods two and three. What we're going to show is the chemical reaction, and we're going to show that energy change 
but we're also going to visualize it with respect to what's happening to all of that bond energy stored in the reactants and products. So when we take a look at these graphs, please put a descriptive title. That's fairly simplistic. We could get further. We could say uh, enthalpy changes for the combustion of magnesium, for example. Please label the y-axis as either potential energy or uh, kilojoules. Your, pardon me, potential energy here. This is the energy difference uh, between what we see as the energy stored in your reactant bonds and your product bonds. Okay, so if the products hold less energy than the reactants, then we should see a surplus of energy given off like we do here. If the products, however, hold on to more energy than the bonds of my reactants, then I see something that is endothermic and they sit at a higher energy position. Okay, so we label that. And then it's reaction progress or reaction coordinate. In other words, this is just time and it's the time it takes for this reaction to complete. So if we take a look at the one we did um, earlier, when we took a look at magnesium, magnesium reacts with half a mole of oxygen to produce magnesium oxide and 601.6 kilojoules. So obviously, be this exothermic reaction, there is an energy difference between reactants and products, and it is quantified as 601.6 kilojoules for this reaction. In the endothermic one, when we were decomposing water, we said you had to input 285.8 kilojoules to make your hydrogen and your oxygen. So we can see that the system has more energy in its products than it did to begin with. And so we see this input of energy or the endothermic component to it. Okay, so that's the theory behind these four methods. We should be able to recognize everything that's going on with them. There's a couple of little uh, tricky bits like the addition of 601.6 kilojoules as one of the additional products, but in delta H that shows as negative, so be mindful of that one. And then just realizing that this is still just assessing the stored energies within our reactants versus our products, and so we see that there are endo and exothermic differences, so we can get an idea of how much energy was stored uh, in the bonds of the reactants and compare that to our products. Uh, in lesson two of this video, I'll go through the examples on the next page. And uh, you can try those in advance of watching the video to see how you do or uh, just follow along with me in the next vid. Okay, hope that made some sense to you guys and see you in lesson two.